All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Well, thanks a lot to me for coming and giving us this talk. Um, Sighting, as, as everyone knows, is one of our three talks that we're having on data and optimization. Uh, it's the first one. The next one is on Tuesday, and then once we have one last one on, on, on Thursday, the next one actually is going to be just on data. Um, so, yeah, so maybe, maybe I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, sure. But we're very, very happy to have you here. Yeah, thank you. So I'm, I'm Henry Moss. I, until very recently, was working at a tech startup in Cambridge called Second Mind. And I've just hopped back into the maths department here at Cambridge. So if you do want to reach out to me, just ping me on my new Cambridge address. Um, but I'm going to be talking about entropy search, which is hopefully going to build on the ideas that um, you've already seen with data optimization. I think this is the correct way. It's certainly a more principled way to think about what's going on in data optimization. Um, there's kind of some subtle ideas, but I think it's very interesting and it's worth kind of persevering. Um, but feel free to interrupt me at any point, especially if mathematicians might not like some of the stuff I'm saying. Um, so we, we can debate. Um, but yeah, let's crack on. So I'm going to actually start with kind of an uh, introduction to base opt and active learning, um, but hopefully through, through kind of a different viewpoint, which is going to motivate better this, this idea of entropy reduction. Um, so before we kind of crack on, I just want to give you a little bit more context for why we kind of care about base optimization. But I personally see it as a special case of a much broader um, kind of point of interest, which is those active learning. So this is where we kind of collect data, um, but we use a model to do it. Um, so we might have some initial data collected through any sort of random means. Um, we'll fix it on a model, and that's like a gassing process, which I hope, hopefully you're familiar with. Um, using that model, we then collect some more data. We might do that sort of several times. We, we look at what happens to the model when we get the new data in, and we use that to sort of drive the search. And we end up with a final model, which is hopefully kind of very well suited to whatever application we have at, at hand. Um, so for example, we might have some sort of true function like this, uh, and we're going to just collect data to learn this function. So we might kind of collect 10 random data points, we've got our model, and it's like this, and so on. So this is just a pure random data generation strategy, but you see that this is the model we end up with at the end. Um, but depending on what we want to use this model for, actually just collecting data randomly is probably not a good idea. Uh, and there's a whole kind of host of things we might be interested in. Uh, in, in kind of like learning. So in, in a regression case, we just want to improve the, the global model, model accuracy. So basically, can we kind of reduce as much uncertainty as possible? So this would be kind of corresponding to a nice space filling design for the data. Uh, we might care about kind of finding the, the optima, so maybe the maximum or the minimum of the process. Um, so this is what I would call based on optimization, and this is what we're going to focus on for the rest of this talk. Um, but we might also be interested in doing something like predicting a threshold, and um, so something like classification tasks. And in that setting, what we do is actually choose data to kind of support um, the threshold level. So I can quickly kind of demonstrate this here. So suppose this is the data set we have, it's a binary classification task, um, something to do with like the rate of malaria in Nigeria. So if the, the rate is higher than a certain threshold, we're at yellow um, or blue, uh, vice versa. Um, and if we just collect random data and fit our model to it, these are the predictions we get with that model, um, and it's not really very good. But if we do something very clever and put the data in the right places, Actually, we can get a much better model that corresponds much better to the uh, the ground truth over there. Um, but this is um, again an example of like a sequential data um, strategy. So we've got a model, and we're trying to improve it for a very particular task, which in this case is kind of recreating this plot over there. Um, but based optimization, this is the focus of the talk. So this is another setting, a very specific setting, where we're interested in only improving our model in the area of the space where there is a maximum or a minimum of the function. Um, so this is a, a, a general approach for model-based optimization, and I'm going to go through it now. So let's suppose we're interested in finding the maximum of the function, um, something a bit like this. So this is the ground truth. We've got no idea what this actually is, but this is the underlying function, and we're trying to find the maximum as quickly as we can. However, we're not interested in just finding a, like a local maximum. These are a bit rubbish on the edge, and actually if we did like a gradient-based method, we might end up there. So what we're interested in doing is finding the global optimum. Um, so this is a much more challenging task than and um, the sort of thing you might throw a gradient descent or stress the gradient descent on. Um, so it's worth kind of being clever and really thinking about what's going on. So using a lot of statistical model. Um, so let's suppose that we now, all we've observed so far are these blue dots. We now need to decide where to next make the evaluation. Um, so there's a couple of things we might think about. We might think about trying to explore the space. We might try and think about um, maybe we should exploit areas that we know are good. So there's kind of a couple of kind of key areas we might go for next. Does anyone want to suggest a point? Where would you evaluate next? Where? To explore on the right hand. Yeah, yeah. So that, that makes a lot of sense. I think we don't really know what's going on. So we should kind of think about what could happen there. But we might also want to kind of go like around here. Yeah, it's quite like promising. It looks decent. 
Well, I suppose it depends if we're maximizing or minimizing. I can't remember what I said now, uh, <laughs> but whatever. Um, so these are the sort of things that we think about um, when we're kind of given this data set. If again, if we're using like a gradient based method, there's no notion of this kind of global coverage of the space. Um, so it's quite natural to try and automate this procedure we've gone through. Uh, and that's where we use data optimization. So here, yeah, we are maximizing now. I apologize if we kind of alternate between maximizations and minimizations, but I've kind of merged two sets of slides together. So I'm worried this might be a theme. Um, but yeah, here we are. So let's suppose that we've collected the data points, these square, these uh, crosses here, and we fitted our model. So this is the Gaussian process model. I'm not going to explain what that is. It doesn't really matter, but hopefully you know. I've been kind of covered that sort of thing. Yeah, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter at all. All that's important here is that the marginals, the predictions at a given point, um, of the Gaussian distribution, uh, and we know what the mean and variance is. That's given by our model. So that's the only thing that's kind of important here. Um, but let's let's try and think about what this model here tells us about where the maximum of a function is. Um, so it's very unclear, actually. And uh, you would think that this very simple model, it's only got five data points. Um, the distribution over the maximum that this kind of induces would actually be very simple, but it's not, it's really good growth. Um, so let's suppose now that we're just sampling from our Gaussian process posterior. So this green line here. Uh, it's just a single sample from the posterior. So this is one possible thing that could happen um, that's consistent with our data and our prior that the function is sufficiently smooth to be well modeled with the Gaussian process. So what I've done is I've, I've actually maximized this sample here. So we've got this blue bar here denotes where the maximum value is. Uh, and we can kind of proceed by doing loads of samples like this. And I'm kind of building up here a histogram of where the maximum is of each of these samples. And you can kind of crack on. Um, and eventually you kind of end up with something a bit like this. Okay, so this is a really horrible distribution. It's empirical distribution for where the maximum of this process is. So I'm denoting that as um, X star is the maximum given the data. Um, so this, I just wanted to stress how horrible this is. Um, but this is really what we want to use to drive our search strategy. We want to be aware of, okay, how much uncertainty do we have about X star and kind of what that means in terms of where we should evaluate to hack away at this uncertainty. And that's really the key part of this entropy-based um, data optimization. Um, but we're going to revisit this later on. But this kind of paints the picture for like everything is going to be quite horrible um, when we get there. But yeah, is this kind of clear what's going on at this point? Um, yeah, cool. Um, but there's two very standard approaches to data optimization. One's called constant sampling. Uh, did you cover? No, okay, nice. And then there's also a more standard approach, which is like utility maximization, so something like uh, expectation improvement. Yeah, this one. Um, but I'm going to start with Thompson sampling. So these two approaches, they're not what I would call an entropy based method, but they kind of help motivate why we care. And um, so uh, let's do something called Thompson sampling. So again, we're still trying to maximize, thank goodness. Um, so what we want to do here is we actually sample according to this horrible distribution, okay, which makes a lot of sense, right? We're going to Probably pick a point that we think the maximum is at, um, but we can also kind of pick points that we're quite uncertain about what the maximum is at. So this kind of encapsulates this explore exploit um, that I discussed before in a very particular way. But as I said, it's actually disgusting to be able to access this thing. Um, but fortunately, for this particular acquisition strategy, this Thompson sampling, um, we can actually just get these samples um, using the procedure I demonstrated before. So we just sample from the posterior and we maximize it. And that gives us a sample from this horrible distribution. Okay, so it is relatively easy to sample from this thing. So that's what Thompson sampling does. So we can go through it now. So let's suppose that we've, we've got those data points as before. I'm uh, here rather than then plotting the posterior, I'm plotting loads of different samples from the posterior itself. Um, so this red line denotes the point we actually choose when we sample from um, the distribution of where the maximum is. Uh, and we kind of proceed over multiple steps. And you see that we're hacking away at the uncertainty. Uh, and we're kind of learning lots about these two areas, which are where the maximum actually is. So you see that we've ended up with a nice spread of data. We have kind of quite general coverage of the space, which is what we want to make sure we're not missing anything. But we've also been able to focus evaluations uh, into this promising area. So this strategy is known as Thompson sampling. Uh, and it's nice, it's quite straightforward, um, and it's very robust as well. Um, so if your model is a bit dodgy, I would always recommend doing one of these sort of things rather than expecting improvement. For the sample, so you add like, this point where you got the function, so you reduce the okay. Sure. And then, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So it's this. Sure, yeah. So this one here. So you sample, take the green curve, you maximize it, and then you make your next function evaluation at the maximize. Ah. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, so this is how you, you build more data in. Mm -hmm. in okay. So each one of these blocks has an extra data point. Sorry, but you're, you're, you just should, you should one point that you're stacked up, you're choosing the red. Yeah, so we're choosing the red ones. You see here. So you're sampling a lot from the Gaussian process, then choose one, and then. Update the model. Sorry, yeah. maybe I should have added more steps here. Um, but you see, like, so we, what I'm doing is I'm sampling from the blue, which is equivalent to sampling a whole function draw yeah. and maximizing it. We've chosen this red one here, and you see on the next step, I've updated the model oh, at this right. point. Right? Um, so that, that we've got them taking into account what's going on. And that's what happens at each one of these steps. Yeah, I would say so. Um, in 1D, it's obviously very, very easy. <laughs> Uh, but I would so certainly in in um, in my old job, this was actually one of the strategies we relied on the most. Uh, it's very yeah. Again, if your model's a bit dodgy, something like this is quite good, um, which is quite 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 possible, right? Especially if you're doing something like data optimization, where each one of these steps, the model has to kind of fit by itself. There's no chance for a human to like check it. Nothing's gone wrong, and a lot can go wrong, especially when you're looking at kind of more sophisticated versions of gaussian processes. Um, so it's nice to have some sort of fail safe methods in here. You were quite on the number of step one, right? Yeah, or not on that, but in a year. Yeah, but I can kind of demonstrate this again. That's, that's yeah, that's the yeah. And actually, if you something that's nice about Thomas sampling is actually, I mean, you can't see it here because I'm only based on a thousand examples, but there's actually some probability everywhere along here. It's completely possible you could get a maximum anywhere. So you've got full support, so you are guaranteed convergence. It's like very, which is nice, and you don't have that with most data methods, which I guess might distress the math. Uh, no, no, so I mean, I've just done this for the plot. In terms of the actual number of samples we make, it's just one for each step. Because okay. that's the one that gives us the data point. Um, something that's nice about this as well is actually if you suppose that you have some sort of parallel resources, um, so maybe you can evaluate 10 at each step, that's super easy to do. You just sample 10 functions and evaluate all 10 of the maximums. Um, whereas again, some of the other approaches are quite hard to scale with kind of batch situations. But I think that question was about sampling the Gaussian process yeah. to reduce your 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 distribution from which then you apply the constant sampling. Ah, sorry, I maybe I haven't been clear here. Um, yeah. yeah. So this is constant sampling. You sample the green function, so that's just one sample, you maximize it, and that's your next point. Okay. So this is constant sampling. But I was doing this so we could see what the distribution looks like. Okay. So maybe I shouldn't, in this plot, maybe I shouldn't have put the blue one on. Um, this is kind of just to show um, how this, uh, this kind of distribution, the blue one, evolved over time, okay. which is, I mean, it just gets more and more odd. Um, this one is particularly kind of horrible. Um, but yeah, so that, that's kind of this, again, a more simple strategy that I think is quite intuitive. So, so that is how we define the maximum. Of the, of the sure, yeah, you can just use like a gradient optimizer. I know I said like yeah. not great because yeah. it pulls yeah. it over, yeah. but this is yeah. super, yeah. super cheap. Yeah. This is so cheap um, to evaluate this sample, incredibly cheap compared to anything else. So you can just, you know, throw loads of multi start gradient descent at it. Um, in practice, it's not too much of an issue. There's a lot of work on like sophisticated acquisition function optimizers, which I'll get into later, but that's kind of they're the same things you can apply here. But typically, I just brute force it. Like a large multi start gradient descent. Um, so it's super, super cheap to do this, to work to make the sample. For the machine learning, you're going to get one the one of the smart work, but you can say like 10 dimensions. Yeah, so maybe you increase the number of multi starts, but actually. Uh, no, no. So it's like in general, this technology, this methodology of finding, I mean, it might be to do a value of the number of points. So is there like some complexity to this slide? Uh, like how many relations would you need to get a certain. The there's there's nothing like that concrete. So if you're interested in just kind of coverage of the function, then obviously that has, has to kind of scale exponentially. But the entire point of phase optimization is you can get away from doing that because you only need to focus on specific parts of the space. But the amount you need depends very, very kind of subtly on what the function looks like. So if it was a function that was wiggly all over the space, then actually we wouldn't be able to learn that function without loads of data. But if it's wiggly all over the space with one massive minimum or massive maximum, we could still do very well in data optimization without having to learn the whole function. But I mean, the standard sort of worst case, known worst case bounds still apply in this context. So you will always have exponential dependencies. The number of function evaluations grows exponentially in all of these examples. This is as a first case. 
if, if you kind of assume that the function, the function you're modeling, if you assume that that actually has come from the like something like a Gaussian process, there's a certain smoothness and a certain um, set kind of set functions, then there are tighter results. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're right. If, if it could be any function. I mean, you yeah. listen, so the typical bounds are of the type sort of smoothness of your yeah. derivative divided by the um, by sort of the accuracy you want to the power of dimension divided by the uh, is derivative. Yeah. And that's sort of the bound that you got. But for like for certain kernels, like if you have like a very, very smooth kernel, like an RBF or something, that's, you can get tighter bounds in there. But yeah. that's assuming kind of infinite degrees of uh, differentiation. Um, but cool. Uh, I'll push on a bit. Um, in the function sampling, and this might look a little bit more familiar. So this is where we actually kind of build a utility function based on the model, um, which is hopefully something you've seen already. Uh, but this is, um, yeah, well, I'm going to talk about expected improvement, which is one example. Um, so let's suppose that we've, uh, we've made the evaluations as before. So now we can say, okay, what do we think is the current best solution? You know, denote, denote this by the black line. And then what we can do is like work out according to the model that we have. So according to our posterior, what is the expected improvement we might see? And that basically corresponds to evaluating, kind of integrating over these red lines. So you get this acquisition function on the bottom here, which you can then maximize, and that gives you your point. And this is very different to what we did before, which was just sample a function from the GP, maximize that. Here we're looking at some sort of um, measure that, that takes into account the whole of the posterior at a given point, um, which is quite neat. Um, but there are lots of practical problems with, with these setups. But when everything is nicely well behaved, these approaches typically do outperform something like constant sampling because you are being a bit more clever. Um, but I'm going to kind of build upon this and go into much more kind of sophisticated ways of doing this. Um, but this is yeah what I just said. So you have this effect improvement thing, uh, and we kind of proceed like this. So now we have an acquisition function, which is uh, what I've got on the bottom here, this red line, and we maximize that to tell us where to make the next evaluation. So here we've actually we have sort back into minimization. So, so now we're trying to minimize the function, uh, and you see that. And um, here, the point we chose, we now put a new evaluation there, and we update our model, and we update the acquisition function, um, and so on. And um, so by the end of here, we kind of focus most of our evaluations around the minimum, so we've been able to pin down where it is, but we also have kind of got a nice spark coverage of the rest of the space to ensure that we're not missing anything. Can you remind me what that is again? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I went a bit quickly through it, but it's just something that takes into account basically the amount of um, uncertainty and also the value at the point. So, for example, there's something like expected improvement, which is the one I guess you covered. I covered uh, I'll for a copy as well. Ah, okay, right. Yeah, let's talk about this then. Sorry. Um, so, in this one, what we do is we say, okay, we've got a current best solution. Uh, and then we say, and um, what's the, if we're going to make an evaluation here at this point, basically we know that it's going to lie somewhere between there and there. It has a, a Gaussian distribution. And um, so, over that distribution, what the expected improvement over this black line that we might see. So this looks something like this. So um, F of X here would be the, the posterior. Okay, you maximize, right? Yeah, we're maximizing. Okay, because that was one quick one. In the next slide, you minimize. Well, yeah, that's why I'm Yeah, sure. Okay. So here you maximize, which is the best you have, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but this is, yeah. You might also look at something like probability of improvement. So you might say, okay, what's the probability that this point is going to be bigger than the black line? And that's also a reason for me to do. Um, but there's kind of some, some caveats there. But the expected improvement is pretty, Pretty good. Um, so basically, I'm going to pick the point which I think is going to improve the most over my current solution. So that's a completely like reasonable thing to do. Um, in practice, it's a little, sometimes a bit a bit a bit tricky if your model's not quite right. But yeah, so that's that's what's going on here. Um, and yeah, just a, a quick plug for Bayesian optimization. I guess you've seen this before, but it's it's great for global optimization. So we can kind of pin down multimodal functions. Uh, and the real reason why we care about it is it's it's the problems where we have a very limited evaluation budget. Um, so we might be doing kind of things that where actually evaluation the function itself could take months, weeks, hours, or minutes. Um, and we also don't need gradients or or even noisy population. So data optimization works very well when you've got a noisy function. Um, I don't even know that you end up in the global minimum. I'm looking at it, yeah, you end up there. Yeah, uh, so I, I think if I if I had come up with this field, I wouldn't call it data optimization. Um, I don't, I would call it kind of Bayesian discovery, I think. I think what you're doing here is that you have such a limited evaluation budget, you just want to find the best thing you can. 
But there's no guarantee that you end up in, in some very case. specific situations. There are some guarantees. So you can show that for certain choices. For right certain, there. if your function lies, it, it's well supported by the model that you choose. Um, the noise isn't too big, blah, blah, blah. You can show a lot of kind of um, asymptotic guarantees. But again, we don't care about those because we've got limited valuation budgets. Okay. Um, uh, just for that, the people, yeah, sure. Yeah, in some situations, you can prove that these work. Yes. In some. You just say, okay, this works most of the time. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I, yeah, I would argue that we don't actually care about the um, asymptotic for the, these problems. I certainly don't. Um, but I'm much more on the practical side of things. Um, so what I, I, yeah, I would call it kind of Bayesian discovery or Bayesian or something else. I think optimization is a bit misleading because I mean, it, we basically never find the optimum. I think the problems we actually care about. Mm -hmm. So ones where there's lots of dimensions, um, we have a very limited evaluation budget. It's all about just finding the best thing you can. Um, I don't know, maybe that's a controversial statement. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, no, I'm not saying it's controversial. I'm just saying if you want to think about it. I mean, for most of these methods, you can prove sort of that you find the global optimum in the limit. The problem is that sort of the asymptotic bounds that you get are often so horrible that they don't work in the sort of practical setting because you can always construct sort of weird counterexamples where these methods simply go horribly wrong. But um, yeah, for these things, mostly I would say the main sort of performance guide is on practical applications and less so on because uh, because you can't prove anything better sort of unless you're in very specific function spaces you can't prove anything better than this horrible exponential bound. Mm -hmm. it's very sort of sort of and anything else is almost impossible yeah but so say for instance you're in a case where you feel like lucky enough the convex function so then everything is much nicer. Oh, so do complexity, then <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. you would use it in a way where you don't know that the function is convex probably, but yeah. you would use it and then and then but but if it's convex and all doesn't compare to 30 percent probably slower. In fact, definitely slower. Yeah. But I think if you had a noisy problem, that's where it might get a bit more interesting, especially with a large degree yeah. of noise. But so that's I'm not sure actually. Okay. So your samples are then you sample five or ten times, yeah. and you get the compile. So the gradient is linear, so then it's the same as the five times. Yeah, yeah, but not, but not, but still, when you do something like gradient descent, you're normally talking about hundreds of steps, thousands of steps. In a phase, up probably might be looking at tens of evaluations, and the gradient descent yeah, probably not converge, yeah. right? So yeah. it's not quite as clear cut as that. No. You're also assuming that you don't have data, though, and that you have to get the data to quite clear. Yeah, I'm not sure. Sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean. Some of the other methods need some more function evaluations, but if you have convexity and you have a certain amount of smoothness, because certain other methods, for instance, the one that we discuss later this afternoon, can find sort of can converge to local optima in the convex setting, you would then converge to global optima and relatively fast, so less than sort of dimension. So sub exponentially. So some of the other methods, even if you don't have gradients, will converge um, slower as if you have gradients, but still they would converge to if it's sort of accidentally convex without ex explicitly exploding. Oh, yeah, it's convex, and I guess yeah. CG or something. It's, it's all that deep, but, uh, still, you would need gradients then, which you don't have in this setting. Yeah. Okay. But, but we were talking a lot about that. Yeah, and I think sure. yeah, like sometimes that, I mean, we were saying exactly what you're saying that basically you have some budget and you try to do a better. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, you couldn't do gradient descent to tune a wind turbine, for example. Uh, <laughs> you will get in discussions with people where sometimes they say, oh, if you tune your model, you could sort of expect gradient information from your simulation model yeah. and so on. So if you are in the sort of one step up, yeah, oh, oh, oh. in a sort of synthesizing mo molecules and so on, they would say, oh, if you have a computer model anyway, yeah, yeah. then blah, blah, blah. But also, I think the search space in these problems would be so large. That, but yeah, anyway, there's certainly a niche for, uh, for data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, this was just meant to be a, a, a plug. But <laughs> um, right.
Yes, and there's obviously a load of call applications just in case anyone's interested. Um, I won't really go into these, but these are kind of the um, the posts of the um, cases that they've got. Um, but I'm going to kind of argue that actually we can think a lot more, and we can probably do quite a bit better for some problems. Um, so what I've talked about so far is that we've got tons of sampling, and we've got things like expected improvement. Okay, so um, neither of these use full knowledge of key of X star community. So this was the horrible wiggly blue thing I plotted before. Um, so something like Thompson sampling, we have a single sample from the posterior. Okay, so we're not using the full distribution of the posterior. And something like expect improvement only actually looks at the marginal distribution of F, right? Um, so we're not using everything we've got, which I think is kind of bad. Um, and actually, these are kind of quite heuristically motivated, whereas what I'm about to talk, tell you about kind of uses the whole distribution and actually makes a lot of sense, certainly for me. Um, and I've spent a lot of time in my PhD and just after my PhD kind of expanding on these, on these methods. Um, so this is what entropy search does. We directly try and reduce our uncertainty um, in the wiggly, horrible blue distribution from before. Um, but unfortunately, this is quite a tricky thing to do. Um, but just as a quick sort of um, prep, um, I'm sure you're very familiar with it, but like, there are many different ways to measure uncertainty. I think like, if you didn't um, care too much, you might think, okay, very is a good way to measure uncertainty. And it certainly is in some, some situations, but I'm going to show you in a moment that it isn't always a good idea. Um, I would argue something like the differential entropy um, is a much better um, metric, perhaps. Um, so P here is just the, the distribution um, of the function, the PDF. So this is a, a basically a function of the PDF. Um, so it's kind of independent of, of some types of scaling. Um, so I'm just giving you two examples here. So we might have a, a normal distribution um, or a uniform distribution, and the variance in the differential entropy look like this. And actually, they're kind of they both kind of grow at the with respect to the same things like that. This one's got a this grows as sigma grows, this grows as sigma grows, this grows as the range grows, this the range grows. So there are kind of some similarities for distributions that look like this, it's a particularly unimodal one. But actually, if we hop into a different setting, um, we get quite different results. So let's suppose that we have a PDF that looks like this. Uh, and then what I've done is I've just chopped it up and squished it apart. And then I've done the same thing, but with a much um, larger kind of um, separation between the two modes here. And so you see, that the different range between these two things is actually the same, okay, which I quite like. That's a nice property to have. And so that's just basically saying how much uncertainty is there in, in the system. And that comes because we're only interested in P here. Uh, we're not interested in actually the value of X itself. Whereas if we use something like variance, you see you look at these two things, and actually the bottom one is a dramatically larger variance, right? It's, it's stretching these things apart. And I would argue that's actually quite misleading um, in a setting like data quantization. Um, and I'll show you that on the next slide. Um, but yeah, certainly for a situation where we're trying to sort of think about a function that looks like this, or sorry, a distribution that looks like this, definitely I think variance would be very misleading and it would kind of send us in the wrong, the wrong direction. Um, so that's the motivation for why we care about entropy or differential entropy, um, because we've got these kind of horrible distributions. Um, so entropy search is just where we, we basically make an evaluation that maximally reduces this thing. So we yeah, measure our uncertainty by the differential entropy, is what I showed you before. Uh, and we have an acquisition function now that basically says, okay, how good or is it worth me evaluating X on my next step? And the way we measure that is where we say, okay, um, what is our current uncertainty minus what we think the uncertainty will be after we collect the next evaluation at this location? Um, so this is kind of gets a bit hairy. Um, maybe actually, does this kind of make sense to people what we're doing here? So we're basically saying, okay, let's make the evaluation that chops the most away from our uncertainty. So we had this horrible wiggly blue thing on the bottom. We're going to make the evaluation that kind of gets rid of as much of that as possible. Um, but actually, we've got these gross terms. Like, as I showed you, this is X star given D is a horrible wiggly blue thing. There's definitely, definitely no analytical form for the, the differential entropy here. So you have to do those kind of Monte Carlo based sampling methods. And then it gets even more complicated here. So we're trying to condition on a, an observed data point that has a certain distribution given by a Gaussian process. Um, so this is all just kind of really hor horrible. Um, and you can calculate this stuff kind of using various sampling strategies. Actually, this is um, Jose Miguel, who's going to talk to you uh, tomorrow, I think. Or, uh, this is some of his stuff, I think maybe from his PhD. I don't know. Um, but it is kind of worth it. So I don't know if you, you've seen plots like this before, but this is like the canonical Bayesian optimization plots. Um, so what you do is you have something called regret um, down here, uh, and this is basically the suboptimality of distribution. So you want this to be as small as possible, as quickly as possible. So what I've done is I've plotted, well actually I've stole this from the paper, probably this one. Um, I've plotted EI here, so expect improvement, and actually you see that these two entry-based methods here uh, actually kind of converge quite a bit faster. 
Um, well, maybe convergent is not the right, the right word, uh, but get better solutions faster. Um, so that's quite nice. So you see here, actually, when you said, okay, are there guarantees for something like EI to converge? You see here that clearly it's probably not going to converge in this problem. Uh, but you have the same like lack of guarantees for these methods, but at least you seem to have made it a bit further. Um, but I would argue still, my point is that if we've only got 20 evaluations, it's about as good as you can get. What, what, what's the thing here? You don't explicitly put any information that you're looking at the max or the minimum. Like you're trying to capture anything when you're trying to do it to it, like reduce the ent entropy of your. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't say focus on the area where the maximum or the minimum is like. Mm -hmm. Not directly, no. Yeah, so, yeah, it wasn't, yeah. Um, so that's kind of interesting, actually. It's quite a subtle point in that something like EI will kind of hammer exactly where we think maximum is. And that is good if your model's very good. But actually, I think it's a much more kind of sustainable strategy to try and like think about everything. and. Um, in a way, it's kind of much less myopic. So you think you're kind of thinking more than one step ahead when you're doing something like entropy search. You're kind of saying, okay, I just want to kind of reduce as much uncertainty as I can, and then eventually that means I'll get a good solution. Um, whereas expected improvement is much more kind of greedy, and you do see that. That's what happens exactly here. Like you kind of you get a bit carried away and you get stuck. Whereas these approaches are able to kind of say, okay, I'm still uncertain in various places. But it's a very different mindset. I think it's it's more kind of well motivated. And in your experience, this works works better as well. Because yeah, um, it is much more expensive, and actually for some very challenging problems, it's completely feasible to run this. So if you look here, there's like a um, so D is a dynamic search space. You've got some like quite hairy costs going on, um, and then cube is great. Um, so it needs to be like very very expensive. Yeah, evaluation. So it's worth it more. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there are kind of um, good stuff, uh, better ways to do this. So this is some something called min value entropy search. So this is um, something I find really interesting. And um, but rather than try and directly minimize kind of this horrible blue wiggly function, sorry, the uncertainty in the blue wiggly PDF, which is this x star given d, we can instead of look, look at the distribution y star given d. The y star here is what we think um, the function is at the maximum. Um, so this is kind of swapping from an input space to an output space. So we're now reducing uncertainty in the output rather than in the input. Uh, this is kind of like a slightly weird concept. Um, but now let's go go through the same sort of mechanism we did earlier. Um, so I've got this sample green function from our Garrison and posterior again. And now I'm kind of building a histogram on the y-axis here. Um, so now I'm just saying, okay, the maximum of this sample is at this point here. And you can build this up in exactly the same way. Um, so we had before this horrible blue uh, uh, PDF like this, and that actually corresponds, if you kind of push it through what we can get is, you end up with this green one here. Um, so in this 1D example, it's not completely obvious why it's better to, to think about this rather than this one. I mean, it is kind of unimodal at least, but there's no real guarantee of that. Um, but the nice thing is, um, like Y star here is always one dimensional. Whereas X star is, um, has the same dimensions as the, the search space. Right? So any sort of gross approximations you have to do are going to be much easier in a one dimensional space. Um, and that's what goes on here. So we have a very similar um, set of physical before with the thing. I'm not going to go into the details. The actual way you calculate this stuff is, isn't that exciting. Um, but the, what's interesting here is kind of the, um, I think it's a more principled way to, to think about these things. Um, there are some guarantees as well that like actually hacking away at this, and you're guaranteed to hack away at this eventually. And actually, if you think about what we care about in these problems, as I've said, it's, you know, based off the heuristic, we're trying to find a good solution as quickly as we can. Actually kind of directly looking at solutions that um, are going to be good um, can give you that. Let me try and phrase that differently. If you imagine that a function where there were multiple places where the maximum was, then we'd always have high uncertainty in X star. Well, not always, but it would be hard to hack away at that. But as soon as we found a good solution, one good solution at least, this uncertainty would look much smaller. So it's, this is kind of a more natural thing to look at if we are really interested in like really resource constrained optimization. Um, but this is exactly the same as what we had before. Um, but now we've got Y star rather than uh, X star. And this is a nice thing to do. Uh, again, these are kind of the usual plots. These are just some toy problems, not very exciting. So I think about it too much, but. Uh, like, so there's, there's this MES, which is the original one. Um, I, I All of my work has got stupid names. So there's Mumbo and Gibbon, uh, uh, things that I've done to extend this into kind of different, different problem settings. Uh, and you do get kind of 
in the boost and uh, in performance. The thing that's important is this plot here. So this is um, standardized over loads of kind of test functions that we might be interested in. Um, and this is um, on the uh, y-axis, this is like the, the regret. So we're going to want it to be as low as possible. So this is kind of the how good a solution we find using the different algorithms, the different data optimization algorithms. You've got expected improvement here, something called noisy expected improvement. Um, MES is the thing I showed you before, this min value or max value that you can search. Um, and then knowledge gradient is this one up here. And then if I'd actually plotted the original entropy searches, they would be well off, uh, off this plot. Because on the x axis here, we have the overhead, which is the time spent actually choosing the next point. And um, so here it's taking like a second. Um, actually, no, sorry, this is standardized between zero and one. I can't remember what the actual numbers are, but suppose that this is taking like tens of minutes. So, depending on how expensive your function is, if it takes a day to evaluate your true objective function, it's fine to kind of piss around for an hour or two picking the next point. Um, but often that's not really um, the setting. If you've got like an hour to evaluate your objective function, maybe you only want to spend a couple of minutes. And um, so you do need to think about these sort of approaches. Um, so yeah, so the this kind of the newer work here has brought these entropy methods kind of which made them practical enough to use them properly, whereas previously, although they kind of gave you some good results, it was taking about hours to choose the next point, which kind of actually does result uh, does result in much less or a much reduced kind of optimization efficiency uh, when you include like the whole cost of object the objective function and the phase optimization overhead. But yeah, that's all I've got to say. Yeah. Do you, do you have any, any thoughts or what of the, of the mean problem? Like, what's your experience in putting a mean problem? Do you have a zero or do you put some kind of, yeah? Yeah, so I mean, on the kernel. Well, I, I guess it's, it's a bit of a problem. So, I've run to the kernel for many of you, I've done Yes, so in many of these settings, yes, sometimes, I mean, it's a bit of a minefield to go and explore all of this. Um, what I tend to do is I put quite hard, like what we call hyper priors, stupid machine learning thing, but just priors on our length scales and things like that in the kernel. Um, you basically, that's quite a good thing to stabilize them. So you are putting models with very little data. You imagine you're doing like a five dimensional problem and you've got 20 data points. Normally, like, I don't know. So my, my background is statistics and we, we wouldn't have touched it. Um, but it seems fine to just plow on regardless of machine learning. Um, so yeah, if you kind of regularize everything really heavily, that helps. Um, I would also not, I'd use like a kernel that's quite smooth, but not too smooth. So I'd use like a maternal kernel. That's quite difficult to use there. Um, but the mean functions is a bit of a minefield as well. Um, typically, like you just pick a, you, you kind of standardize your data and then you pick a zero mean function. You can get decent boosts in performance if you, if you know certain things about the problem and you can encode that through the mean function or through the kernel. And um, that's what a lot of the like the research is. So like when I was at Second Mind, we were fine-tuning um, engines and we knew certain relationships between certain inputs. Um, so certain inputs were like periodic and various things like that. So you just start put the right kernels in and that gives you a huge boost in, in performance. I think actually, I mean, I've, I've sort of ratted, sort of gone on about uh, acquisition functions, but I think that's something I find interesting. Um, but actually it, the real kind of, but bottleneck on performance is having the right models for these things. I think, like we've, like even on these plots, right? Like you know, they're all kind of doing all right. They're all kind of hammering away at the solution. It's a log scale on the y-axis, um, but if you had the wrong model, if you had a really bad model, you just wouldn't learn anything. Um, so I think, yeah, the modeling is something that's really important to think about. And if you know anything about the problem, you should do your best to encode that in somehow, either through a mean function or through um, specific choices of kernels. This is a super nice tutorial. Do, do you have any other, like, that people here can refer to any kind of tutorial online that you gave or anything um, you know, that, that you would recommend? No, so there's not much about the entropy stuff out there, really. There's some really confusing ones um, I would avoid. Uh, <laughs> but I think this is this is like a nice extra and a bit of messy fun data optimization stuff. But I certainly think. If I, you know, I, I, this is like the fourth or fifth thing I try. If I was tackling a new basic optimization problem, I'd be trying loads of other stuff first. I'd really like nail down the, the model. I think about that a lot. And I'd start with very simple like, acquisition functions. This is like the final step is thinking, oh, actually, maybe we can, um, we can get a bit of extra performance out. And by the way, so, so, sorry, finally, your method debug. Yeah. That seems to be even much faster than an expected improvement, for example, to select the new box. Yeah, so it's to do with as well the, um, 
we've discussed it earlier, actually, the cost of doing the access and function optimization. It can be much easier. Something like Gibbon is can give you very like unimodal execution functions, or at least less multimodal, and it can be much easier. So the, the cost there is the cost of doing L the base up, fitting the model, uh, optimizing execution function, choosing the next point. Um, so that's where that sort of comes in. We've got some stuff that the paper where we talk about the same thing. Right. Thanks again. Thank you very much.